Hey there, my name's Crew. Welcome to our YouTube channel today. We believe that as you receive this content, your life's going to grow like never before. We say here at Elevate Life that as we elevate our thinking, we elevate our life. And before you jump into the message, hopefully you like, share, comment, subscribe to this channel for more content coming up. And a reminder, this is our year to advance, and advance we will. Enjoy the message. Just remain standing for a minute. This coach thing, you know. I can tell you that the ladies like to get in on this coaching action too. It's not just all about the men. And so I'm going to ask you to put down anything you have in your hand. You ready? We're, uh, we're just going to kind of get ready for the message. Now, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through some quick cows. And uh, I'm going to say ready. And when I say ready, I want everyone just to kind of just lean forward a little bit. Not too much. Just a little bit. Okay? Lean, lean forward just a little bit. And every time you do that, you're going to give me one of these. Huh! Got it? Right, you got to let it come from way down deep. Because it's got to be, you got to be really loud, you know? And then what's going to happen is this. As I move, you just follow my hands, all right? Everybody ready? Okay, now, the first, now what we do first of all, we clap it out. Let's go right here. Come on. Ready. Ha. 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 Clap it out. Clap it out. High five the person next to you. Go ahead. You may be seated. Today's a special day. It's special because we have an opportunity to be with our closest friends and people that we have walked with a long time. Now, how many of you have been in this church at least 10 years? Would you raise your hand all over this place? Wow, what a wonderful representation. How many of you have been here at least five years? That's powerful as well. What I will tell you is it doesn't take 10 years or five years for you to understand that you have the most authentic leaders on the planet. I want to thank you, Pastor Keith and Pastor Precious, for not caving in to the pressure of traditional ministry and deciding that you had to take somebody else's personality or shtick, I thank you for being uniquely you, one of a kind, and teaching all of us that we have a one of a kind fingerprint as well. When you look at these lives, it's inspiring. I'm not talking about what they share from the stage. I'm not talking about what they write and publish that's so beneficial to all of us. I'm talking about just observing their lives is so inspiring. Incredibly, the closer you get to them, the more inspiring and convincing their lives become. I know. Because I have known them since they were college students. I used to meet with Pastor Keith regularly during those days. He would come towering above me. And I was always trying to convince him that God was calling him to be my tight end. <laughs> I said, do you know how God could bless us both? If you could just walk in obedience, you're not a basketball player. You're a football player. And he never believed me. And so as painful as it was, I just had to enter his life on a whole different level. And we had a relationship that was precious, a big brother and a little brother. A big brother that had been in ministry since he was 17 and a little brother who longed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would go to a corner of the gymnasium there at Evangel. 
and jump up on this old concession stand and we would sit there on this this counter in the corner where no one would hear our conversation and then he would pour out his heart and we would talk I would listen mostly and then I would hopefully give some advice um, on the weekends I would uh, often take several of my football players and I would take them to these meetings I had scheduled where I was going to preach at churches there in that area of Missouri and Kansas. And I just invited Keith. I said, Keith, you want to go with me? He said, oh, would I love to go? Well, already he had this unbelievable singing voice. And I had recorded some albums, actually. Um, and I would sell them at, you know, my crusade meetings and kind of help me with gas and stuff like that. Didn't sell a lot of them. But, but what I knew was this. I knew that, that Keith uh, knew all those songs. He had those amazing top 20 albums that I had recorded. <laughs> That's the ultimate tongue-in-cheek, ladies and gentlemen. But he had memorized all of the lyrics, and so we're on our way to one of those meetings one day, and I said to him, Keith, do you know these songs? He said, I know all of them. I said, okay, here's the deal. You are now the singer for the crusade meeting. <laughs> and so Keith would get up and sing, and then I would take a couple of the young preachers on my team, and on the way to the crusade meeting that weekend, I would say to one of them, okay, this is point one of the message. Now you start studying. You've got two hours before we get there and you develop point one. And then I would say to the other one, now this is point two of my message. Now you develop that. And he would develop that. And I said, and I will clean it up. I knew that I could do just that if it got too far out of hand. We had a wonderful time in those days. And from that time to this, we have had the blessing to look at these exceptional, great lives. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, may I declare to you that your leaders live great lives. The Apostle Paul said this to the first generation church. He said, imitate me. Now, I want you to see this in case you think that what I'm about to do is unscriptural. It is very scriptural, and it is the heart of God. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, the Apostle Paul was not unduly or in some um, abnormal way trying to exalt himself. He was simply saying, as I follow Christ, I want my life to become a visual aid for you. Now, let me just say this to you. That is never something that your leaders would say. But this morning, I've come to say it. And that's why my subject is simply how to craft a great life. You can go ahead and clap. There's no doubt, Deons and I absolutely love your pastors. Nobody would rather be with than Pastor Keith and Pastor Sheila. But we're not so close to them that we're blind to the everyday excellence of their lives. These two people live lives of greatness. Day by day, they literally live out the very principles they are teaching from God's Word. It's never a time that this man or this woman stand here and talk to you about implementing strategies and principles of life that they are not already living that out. Deons and I and our kids have had courtside seats to watch them live out these remarkable lives. So this morning, I want to share just a small part of what we've observed about how to craft a great life. These are from my own observances, but I can tell you 
I am sure that they are similar, if not identical, to your own observances. You see, the fact is, first of all, if you want to craft a great life, you must begin with a real relationship with Jesus Christ. I said you must begin with a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Every time a church like this church, and there aren't many, is planted in a community, there are those that come out of curiosity. And then there are also those that come out of hunger. They hunger to know God. They hunger for their marriages to be better. They hunger for their addictions to be broken. They hunger to start over because the road of their life in the past has been discouraging and depressing. It has been oppressive for them to live at times. And they just feel that by coming to a place like this, they might be able to get some kind of help as to how to begin to better themselves. Now, we live in a self-help world. And a self-help world is one of the most discouraging things in the world because there is no such thing as self-help if you really want to craft a wonderful life. You, first of all, you see, have to have a relationship with the living God that begins with a real, dynamic, life-transforming experience with Christ. And every one of you in this place needs to know this. We are not teaching you here how to eventually become better people. We are not teaching you here how to eventually overcome your habits. I believe in 12-step programs. I think they're wonderful for people that are fighting addictions. But there is no way to 12-step your way into the kingdom of God. You one-step your way into the kingdom of God. He comes into your heart. I had the opportunity to go to a coliseum where... Pastor Keith was going to be speaking to these corporate, excited people. And I, I was so fired up because everybody in the room was enthusiastic. I was in the green room before we went out. And it was just so cool to just see that everybody was smiling. Everybody was just emanating such energy. They were here to learn. They were here to prosper. They were here to get secrets. And I parked myself over to the side of the big stage. And of course, there were so many people there. And I just was sitting there in the darkness going, I cannot wait to see Pastor Keith's version of a wonderful corporate speaker. I said, man, I'm going to see his Zig Ziglar. <laughs> and as he began to speak, he began to talk about how he died when he was a little boy and his mamma prayed him back to life. And I said, man, that's great. He's starting with that. Uh, he'll get around to the other stuff in a minute. And then he began to talk about his relationship with Jesus. And I said, wow, he's really carrying this on here. It's, that's, he's bold. In this setting. Now everybody throughout the whole thing was standing, clapping, applauding. It sounded more like a revival meeting than it did some corporate executive or sales meeting. It, it was just awe-inspiring. And I thought that's wonderful that, well, he never got through with that line of speaking. <laughs> he talked about Jesus the whole time. And then he finished by telling those people that the secret to his life was that he had received Jesus and Jesus had transformed his heart and life and that Jesus was there to transform their lives. And he asked, how many of you want to receive Jesus? I want you to stand. I said, he's given an altar call. Can you believe it? And the reason why is even though this man 
has answers for a lot of things in life. He is the ultimate Renaissance man. He has one tune, one note, and he hits it over and over and over again. And that is, none of this is possible. None of it has any meaning. None of it has a future tied to it. None of it is going to be enlightening. None of it is going to make you successful unless you first of all meet this Lord Jesus Christ and you have him come into your heart and transform you completely. You want to craft a great life? Then you have to follow the craft ideology that begins with the crucified, resurrected Son of God who has a burning desire in his heart to enter your life and to change everything. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask Christ into your life because that's what you're looking for. You're not here to find steps to change. You're not here to find philosophy of life that somehow will surround you and eventually move in so that you can have something good happen in your heart and your life. No, you're here to receive him in a moment and to be transformed in a moment. And let me tell you, this morning is going to be that moment for so many of you. Secondly, if you want to craft a great life, then all of life has to be precious to you. I'm kind of amazed as how people excerpt certain passages of Scripture. For instance, I want to read this entire passage from uh, Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows, listen, that you need them. So many believers have taken the passages that I've just read and said this. Clothes aren't important. Food's not important. Things aren't important. And that's not at all what this passage says. What this passage says is, don't worry about those things. And it also says, your father knows you have need of them. But then it ends this passage with this scripture. And some of you didn't even know it was in the same context. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. Will somebody say all these things? Will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. You know, I've had the privilege of watching these people bring the kingdom of God into every single life experience. But what I want you to understand is Pastor Keith's philosophy of everything about everything shouts this out. Life is important people, all of it, and we need to live all of it to its fullest. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're offended by that, there's no hope for you. 
because this is the message that people are looking for in the world. The Word of God says that all things were made by Him and all things consist of Him. There is absolutely no way that we can ignore the fact that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And everything about our lives needs to be important. Your body's important. You'll hear it from this stage. This is what the man preaches. Your mind is important. Your nutrition and training is important. Your finances are important. Your investments are important. You must invest in yourself, your family, your friends, and your future. Your relationships are important. Your house is important. Take care of it. It's where you live. Believe for a better one. God wants that for you. Your devotional time is important. Your growth personally, your belief system, your sowing, your faith and faithfulness are important. Everything is important. Everything is about everything. God doesn't bless anyone or allow them to craft a wonderful life if they get lazy in any part of life. We have to stand up and realize we are called not to excellence, but to excellence in the kingdom of Almighty God. I coach a football team, and I have what I call Patrick Denny's optimal performance spectrum. It's seven, seven areas where we measure the performance of our players. We sit down as a coaching staff and we grade them one, two, or three in these areas. And the scores have been uncanny in their ability to predict success and failure. In fact, we so believe in that spectrum, that measurement of performance, that if the game is on the line, we will never give a kid, no matter what his ability, the ball, if he's low on the spectrum. Because it actively predicts who you won in the game and who you won in the game in a tight situation. Last game, we had a young man who is very talented. He's a three on skill set, which is the first entry. Every time, he is a 100-meter champion. He's a 200-meter champion. He's a long jump champion. He breaks long kickoffs for touchdowns. He's absolutely extraordinary. But last game... We watched as he had four or five opportunities to turn the game around and every time came up short. And I said to my coaches, the spectrum never lies. We're talking about the measurement of performance. Now, our evaluation is not just taken from the field, but it's from every known area of our players' lives. It's from everything that is observable from our vantage. For instance, when my players come in to the meeting room. They are to sit up straight, and the very first thing they're to do is to straighten chairs. So when I walk in, what you will see is all 50 or 60 of those players begin to straighten chairs. I mean, it is a project. They're doing their best to get their chairs and their rows exactly straight because they understand our pastor Keith's Keithology. Everything is about everything. Straighten the chairs. Because if you can't straighten the chairs, I can't depend on you as an offensive lineman to get the proper split between you and the next player. If we want two feet, we want two feet. I don't want a foot. I don't want three feet. I want you to have two feet between you. I can't depend on the running back to get in the proper stance and to not jump off sides. You see, the fact is, you can just, oh, that's not very important, your life right into the pig pen. It's all important. We have a principle on our team that's called, it's called the good enough. Good enough. I said, we are not going to be that's good enough people because it's never good enough if you're a believer. You're never a good enough husband. You're never a good enough wife. You're never a good enough child. You're never a good enough boss. You're never a good enough employee. You're never a good enough praying man or woman. You're never a good enough giver. You're never good enough. Why? Because there's so much more that God always has for you. And you've got to be reaching and stretching and believing. 
And if there's anybody in the world that exemplifies that, it's these crafts. And that's why we have to learn how to craft a great life. Number three, if you want to craft a great life, you must live a life of honoring others. This is a passage of scripture I quote over and over. Especially when people are asking me about this principle of honor. What I've discovered on the wonderful, anointed Instagram is that there are a lot of people that are against things like loyalty, honor, and respect. I'm talking about people in the kingdom of God. They, they actually have whole doctrines against honor. Are you, are you kidding me? If there's one thing that we are desperately needing right now, it's honor. And if you are going to craft a wonderful life, then you've got to see the example of your pastor's and imitate them as they imitate Christ because you will not find more honoring people on the planet than your leaders. They don't just teach it. They exemplify it every single day. I've, I've watched Keith and Sheila for years as we have bumped into various ones of you at restaurants, um, grocery store, just different places around town. And it's never going to be, hi, and walk away. It's always going to be, oh, oh Denny, come here, Denny, Deonza, come here, come here. I, I want you to meet Betty Sue. Let me tell you Betty Sue's testimony. And let me tell you the gift that she has. I mean, it's extraordinary. You, you can't even get anywhere with them when you're traveling around because, oh, but you've got to hear his story and you've got to hear her story and you've got to hear their story. And let me, it's just amazing. And I, I'm going, oh God, that's who I want to be. I want to craft my life like that where I don't just pass people with a hello or a pat on the back, but where I know their story and I'm able to stand and honor them in front of my friends. That doesn't just happen. You have to decide that you want it to happen. And the scripture that I was talking about that I quote most often is this one. The Bible says, honor the brotherhood. Honor the king. Honor all men. Women are in there. Honor the brotherhood, honor the king, honor all men. In other words, if we live any kind of life at all, it should be a life of honor. Do you know how that it would improve your quality of life if you could just get the critic out of your mouth? You know how it would change your life if you didn't feel you had to have an opinion about everything? Do you know that I was free the day I decided I didn't have to have an opinion. And it was soon after that that a friend of mine walked up and he wanted to know about some political thing. And I started to open my mouth and to say something that I was totally unqualified to say that God certainly hadn't called me to address. And I just turned to him and I said, I don't have an opinion. He said, of course you do. I said, no, I don't. He said, you've got to have an opinion. I said, Neither. no, I don't. I don't have to have an opinion. I'm not going to have an opinion. There. I don't have one. So there. Well, you've got to. No, I don't. I don't have an opinion. I felt as free as a bird. From that time to this, I have discovered I don't have to have an opinion. I can walk in honor rather than the releasing all the pollution from my negative opinions into the air that is already polluted. We have got to become people like our leaders who always are speaking honor over people, who are always speaking blessing over people, who are always believing the best about people. I want to craft my life like that. Amen. You, 
can never have a great life. You can't craft a great life, folks. Look at me and listen because I want to speak right into your souls now. I want to speak right into the emotion of your life. You can never craft a great life if you remain bitter. I have a young man on my team. And he feels that he was very wronged by the coach at his previous school. In fact, he's a senior and he's come over to our place. He's not going to be eligible to play at our place. And that's broken heart. That's, that's broken his heart again. Because he's, you know, out of district and we have very strict district laws there as, as far as the Louisiana High School Athletic Association. And when I told him that he was not going to be eligible, he just, he went into almost a tirade of anger. So I waited a couple of weeks and then I walked over to him this past week and I just said, um, listen, you've got to forgive your coach and move on. And his eyes flashed with such anger. This is just a teenager. He said, I've got to keep him with me. I'll never let him go. Because he gets me up in the morning. He makes me fight to prove him wrong. And I said, oh, young man, listen to me. Listen to me. I said, I've dealt with thousands of young men like you. And if you hold on to him, you will never, ever move forward. You will never succeed as long as you have this grievance, you've got to let him go. And it was as if in that moment the Holy Spirit came right onto the practice field. He's dressed in his pads and helmet. And I'm standing there dressed like his coach because that's who I am. And it's just the two of us having a moment while the offense is running plays. And I watched God break him. And he reached over and grabbed me and buried his helmet into my chest, sobbing. He said, thank you, coach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as I held him, I thought, now he's got a chance. Here's what you've got to understand. You've got to let it all go. And what you're moving toward is not natural. It's supernatural. Because... You are moving from offense and hurt and bitterness to honor. Here's the last one. In fact, this is actually just point four of uh, my real message of 400 points, but... I'm not going to get to those. Can somebody say amen to that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Never forget preaching one Sunday morning at our church. And a gentleman walked up and he said, Oh, that was the longest message I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> he said, I was beginning to wonder if I was going to ever see my family again. <laughs> if you want to craft a great life, you must live to give. You must live to give. The first significant sign in the Bible of the emerging New Testament church as a community is found in Acts 4. And this is what the Bible says, starting with verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. And they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerful at work in them all. That, that there were no needy persons among them. Now please listen to the fact that this is a sentence that is broken up by verses. Hear this. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. In other words, what the scripture is talking about here is that the grace of God had so begun to work in people that they began to give what they had. In an unusual manner, they became generous and there was no need 
among them. Do you know what happens to so many people that determine that they're going to chase the dollar or they're going to believe that a certain level of money in their bank account is finally going to bring them security? They never stop being needy. You know that even people that have $50 million in the bank today or $100 million, they are so paranoid that they're going to lose that money that they are constantly needy. But when the grace of God begins to work in our lives and we discover the power of generosity like the crafts have discovered, suddenly there is no need. There's no fear. Money doesn't control us anymore. And we genuinely believe that God is the one who supplies all of our needs according to his riches in glory. This wonderful demonstration of the New Testament church sees people who are selling land and bringing it to the apostles, who are selling possessions, bringing it to the apostles. Now, why are they bringing it there? Is it because there are that many hungry people or there are that many desperate people? No, they are bringing it to the, to the apostles because they truck these men that they are sold out to God and that they are going to head up their strategic building of the kingdom of God on the earth. They want to be a part of it. A few minutes ago, we heard Pastor Keith as he stood here and he began to talk to you about the power of the tithe. Now, can I just take the liberty to just kind of be a translator here of this man's heart because I know his heart so well? Here's what he's saying to you that he would never say on this pl platform probably. He's saying, guys, let me tell you, I have lived by my giving. I want you to have the life I have. I want to tell you guys, when I tithe, God fights the demons of hell that try to come against me. When the devil came against me to try to take me out with a heart attack in a town that was not even one I was familiar with, I can tell you that it was no big deal because he promised that he would rebuke the devourer. He is shouting to us, get on board. I want this for you. Get on board. I want this for your family. I want this for your children. I want this for your future. He is saying, I honestly believe the word of God with all of my heart. And when the word of God says that he will rebuke the devourer and the word of God says that he will pour out a, pour out a blessing from heaven that you can't even contain, I really believe that all of that stuff is true because I've seen it in my own life and I have not lived by my investments and I've not lived by my acumen concerning handling money. I have lived by my giving. And I want that for you. I want that for you and for your children and for your grandchildren and for your legacy. I want you to be protected and blessed. I want you to have no lack. I want you to be successful. I want God to be for you. Because if God is for you, who can be against you? You see, we're crafting a life because God has given us a visual aid. And let me just say this to you, folks. Not every pastor on the planet is a visual aid of what they preach. I can tell you it's very rare. It's very rare to find a man who is walking in every revelation that he shares because I've watched him preach throughout the years and he always preaches from the spillover. From the overflow, he's with God during the week. God is working with him in this season of his life. And then he comes here and he just spills on you what God is doing in his life. And what we need to do is to get drenched with the spillover of a man's life because he's not just teach cheap talk. He is a man who's living and practicing exactly what he's communicating. Will you all stand, please?
Keith, Sheila, I, I honor you. I love you. And I, I know you know that, how much I love you. To be in your presence is rest for my soul. I can't explain it. You know, we were uh, at dinner last night. And we were talking about going somewhere. We ought to just go somewhere. And I looked at Keith and Sheila and I said, why? That's just a lot of trouble. Because what I'm getting out of this doesn't need a cruise or a lake or a seaside. Because wherever I am in their presence... I am at rest because I sense the presence of my Lord who reigns in them. We honestly, we can't spend 10 minutes away from the scripture or away from a principle that God is working in our lives. Have you noticed that? It's just like our whole relationship. It's, it's about what he's doing in us and through us. And when we look at their lives and their children and their grandchildren, we want that. That's not wrong. That's not coveting. No. God has put them as a visual aid, just like the Apostle Paul said, I'm the visual aid as long as I follow him. Watch me. Imitate me. Hear me right now, everyone. It's God's will that you not just have a better life, but that you have the best life. I was with Joel Osteen last week on his radio show. He wanted to interview me about God, family football. So Deons and I went to uh, Houston and we're with him. And I sat there looking at this dear, wonderful man thinking, oh my so many people hate him because he's standing up and saying to us, you can live your best life now. What a crime that is. Same with Keith, Sheila. They really believe that God's in everything. Oh, but these people, they preach the prosperity doctrine. Well, let me tell you about that. When I was a young man, I got around some old preachers who were tired and bitter, and the only thing they had left was the war horse in them. And they indoctrinated me. And so I would go toe to toe with people that believed in prosperity and believed that every time they prayed, they got healed and the faith message, they called it. And finally, I went home and I told Deanza, I said, I'm done. She said, what are you talking about? I said, those guys aren't right. She said, what do you mean? She said, well, I got the wrong side of the argument. I'm arguing for poverty, sickness, and bondage. And I said, I'm done. And let me tell you something. I've been a prosperity and healing guy every time since that time. And I told everybody, if I ever get sick in the hospital, you call somebody to pray for me that believes I'm going to get well every time. Look and listen to me. God wants to move into your life. It's got to have a beginning, though. It's, listen to me. It's got to have a beginning. You've got to ask Christ to come into your heart because the miracle of Christianity is not just the crucifixion and the resurrection. The most astounding part of Christianity is that we serve a God who has expressed his desire to live in a man's heart. That's amazing. And that's why he sent his son to be crucified and he was raised from the dead the third day because he wants to live in you. And that's why today is your day. Standing right where you are in your space is the day where you are going to receive Christ into your life. 
and you will be changed forever. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and shut yourselves away with God. How many of you say, Pastor Denny, I have been coming to this church because I really want to be a different person. And you'll say, I like what I'm hearing. Or maybe you're here for the first time today and you'll say, I really enjoy what I'm hearing. But you'll say, I have not, listen, I have not had the kind of experience with Jesus that you're talking about where my life was changed in a moment and where he began to speak to me and work in my life. You say, I haven't had that happen. You'll say, but I'd sure like for that to happen. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. Ready? One, two, three. Raise your hand all over this place. You'll say, I want that to happen. Look at all the hands. How beautiful. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave your hand raised as if you're reaching out to take his hand. We know it's just an image. But as you're reaching out to take his hand, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I want this. I want to see you craft a new life for me. So I ask you to come into my life. And I ask you to forgive me for all my sins. I know I'm a sinner. And I need you. I pray that you will walk with me from this moment on. If anybody asks me if I am a believer, my answer will be absolutely. Because on Sunday morning at Elevate Life Church, I did what the Bible said I needed to do to be born again. I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. Help me, O oh God, to craft a wonderful life where you are in the center of everything. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I love you all. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Diddy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here at Elevate Life Church, we exist to help people discover God, develop themselves, and deploy them into leadership with a biblical worldview. There's three great ways to do that today. Take your next step by joining a group, serving, or giving. You can text serve, group, or give to 972-945-9772. Say thank you for being those kind of people. We look forward to seeing you here soon on our YouTube channel.